I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the right to be forgotten because I expect that news might have uh, sort of been less present here than they were in Europe. If you are European, you haven't heard about the right to be forgotten, it means that you were on holiday on the moon because it was impossible to escape the debate. This refers to a uh, decision by the European Court of Justice uh, about the so-called Google Spain uh, uh, versus uh, uh, Mario Costello Gonzalez. The story is quite simple. A long time ago, about 15 years ago or so, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, a Spanish gentleman, had a couple of small properties repossessed financial troubles, had to pay, couldn't pay, lost his properties. The court at the time decided that the best way of selling the properties was to force legally the local newspaper to advertise these two properties. So there were a couple of lines, small tiny lines on a local newspaper which said, oh, Mr. Gonzalez has these two properties repossessed, they are on sale, they are in such and such place and so on. Fast forward, La Vanguardia, the newspaper, gets digitized, the whole archive, including these two small notes. And when Mr. Gonzalez started looking uh, for his own name, what interest he had to Google himself, well, we all know because we all do it, but you know, it's kind of you know, indulgence, but why not? He discovered that uh, that note was the first thing he bumped into every time. Clicking on it didn't help, but you didn't quite realize that the more you see it, the more you're going to see it. He asked the uh, local court to have it removed from the newspaper. The local court explained that you cannot remove things from newspaper. It's on paper. I mean, it's uh, in archives and so on. You know, the, the days when you started burning stuff in the square are uh, gone, uh, certainly in Spain. So it couldn't be removed from the newspaper, but didn't know what to do with the links provided by Google to the digitized copy. Not knowing, referred the case to higher courts until it reached the European Court. The European Court said, remove it. We think that uh, the presence of those links to legally publish material available on the internet are not to be there. You can see that that starts getting controversial. The outcome, broadly speaking, is that an internet search engine must consider requests from individuals to remove links to freely accessible web pages resulting from a search on their name. In other words, if you are in Europe, you search under Luciano Floridi and you discover that something there is not quite of your liking, you can ask Google to remove the link, not the information. The information stays. But the link to that particular page has to be erased. On what grounds? Well, there are some limits. Not anything and anyone uh, can uh, perform that kind of removal. The grounds for removal, and now the philosophers can have a day, uh, appear, not is, appear. Appear to be, the particular information in question, inadequate, irrelevant, no longer relevant, interesting distinction here, or excessive in the light of the time that had elapsed. On these grounds, the court decided that Google was guilty and forced Google to remove the links. Google uh, complied and the links were removed, but it complied uh, reluctantly. I wasn't too happy to comply, uh, especially because this left an enormous amount of gray area uh, undecided. Unfortunately, this decision uh, confirmed a so-called right to be forgotten, which is nowhere to be found. Uh, there is no such thing as right to be forgotten, as we know it. It's not that there is a declaration of human rights where somewhere says right to be forgotten and definition. What you really have is a combination of uh, a couple of articles uh, from the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European uh, Union uh, that are something got something to do with uh, privacy, privacy in the UK, and uh, data protection. Now, why is this interesting? It's a small episode in Spain, nobody should have cared less. 
because it's a classic spark that has generated a whole explosion of issues. And uh, in the rest of the talk, I want to illustrate what these issues are. Now, at this point, you have the very broad context, what memories are, and the very small spark. So I need to fill the gap in the middle. How we move from Plato and Shakespeare to the small Spanish case in Google. Well, the road in the middle, the space in the middle, is covered by several issues on which I will be very brief because of the following picture. There is a lot to be discussed. This is supposed to be too small for you to read. So don't even try, uh, especially if you're too far away. But I want to address those 10 points rather quickly so that you understand why this generated a huge na international debate, at least in Europe, why this represents a sort of a divide between, broadly speaking, stereotypes, American culture versus European culture, and why the small spark has generated such a, an interest uh, among academics, journalists, mass media, and the general public. Point number one. This has shown something that we didn't quite expect, but we could have predicted. There's a conflict between uh, privacy and freedom of speech. Now, uh, there's a mistake uh, made also by well-known people, uh, in fact, scholars who should know better, which is the following. When you talk about the fundamental principles at the foundations of a liberal democracy, people think in terms of columns, you know, like a Greek temple. There's column one, column two, and they sustain all these things, and columns are not in conflict. They all together sustain this beautiful building. That is rubbish. They can be in conflict. Privacy and freedom of speech are two of the fundamental sort of pillars of our liberal democracies, and sometimes, unfortunately, if you're not careful, they clash because you want to have the cake and eating it at the same time. And those are two fundamental principles of well-being. I want to have the cake and I want to eat it. Yeah, But unfortunately, no, they don't get together. Likewise, uh, in this particular case, the privacy of an individual may clash with the right of a private company to link anything that is legally available on the web. If you constrain me and say you cannot do it, but at the same time, I could have come here with a T-shirt with that sort of three lines from La Vanguardia printed on it, and that would be fine, you know that you have a conflict, that something is not quite right. So this debate started being, not became, uh, at some point in, a few, in the past few months, a debate between which kind of balance you want to have between these two fundamental principles. It was also made possible by something that we were not acquainted with in the past. Uh, we started in recent years, uh, certainly in living memory, to unglue, detach the availability of information on the one hand and its accessibility. Good old days when I was an undergraduate, in order to get that book you had to walk to the library. There were no alternatives. I know that sounds impossible to some of you. Yeah. That was those the days. Nah, there were not even mobiles, amazing, uh, or cell phones here. Now, therefore, the availability of that book was its accessibility. There were two sides of the same kind of uh, book. Today, of course, that's no longer the case. And you can actually the link something that is there. Why this is causing such a headache? It cuts both ways. So uh, I'm not sure when, when listening to Google, I, I wasn't quite sure they, they understood how also self-harming the library metaphor is, the following one. Google defended itself by saying, we're just providing the library catalog of the books, neutral in that sense. The neutrality of the library catalog is in, uh, can be questioned, but what can also be questioned deeply is the value of the strategy for the following reason. Today, the map of the territory is more valuable than the territory. If you remove the accessibility, the availability of the information is pointless. This was very, made very clear by um, The Guardian, one of the major newspapers in the UK, when we had the consultation in London. They said, and they are on record, the whole archive of The Guardian is accessed through Google. If you remove a link to that piece of information, that piece of information is as if it had never been published in the first place. So the map is what determines the territory.
So when you tell me that you are just a map, not a territory, well, one problem with that is that even if the analogy is reliable and there are big questions about it, it's self-defeating because that is exactly what the European Court wanted to do, to remove the item from the map so that the availability information would be irrelevant. So in a way, you're just conceding the point to the European Court of Justice. The reply is that, of course, in this dialectic, is that on the other hand, well, then becomes censorship. And that was uh, Jim Wales in our group complaining about, because if the map is so important, then removing items from the map is tantamount, equivalent to not having the information in the first place. And in this dialectic, you can see uh, how the problem starts becoming more important. New question, who is in charge of this accessible, available information online, which creates such a clash between fundamental principles? Politics? Business? The legal system? Well, at the moment, the, the solution that has been found, which is a, a compromise, and as all compromises is disappointing for everyone, which is, means it's a good compromise. Uh, you know, if any, any, anybody's unhappy, surely, you know, that's the nature of a compromise. Um, is that it's Google that decides, or the search engine. No, it could be any other search engine. Is the search engine uh, that de determines whether your request to have those links to your information removed is accepted or not. So paradoxically, the political power that wanted to reacquire control over information, and mind that political power since the times of Richelieu onwards, Westphalia system for the politicians among us, has always been no, an attempt to control information for good reasons, not necessarily for nasty reasons. Well, not Richelieu in that case, but... Um, uh, no, ask the three musketeers. Uh, but in that Westphalian context, with the state as the information agent that wants to regain control of information, having missed the train about 10 years ago when Europe left to private companies the control of search, thinking, oh, that's business anyway, and now we're realizing that, no, the map counts more than the territory. Oops, we left the map in the hands of American companies. We are, technically speaking, screwed. Uh, so now that it's time to regain control of the map, well, who is in charge here? business or, pol or politics. Well, paradoxically, the third power, the legal system, decided business. And that's uh, strange because politicians are very happy about it, not quite understanding what kind of game has been played here. A beautiful problem for anyone with any acquaintance with the law. I'm talking to some of the experts here. Uh, Westphalian system, again, 16th century, more or less onwards, uh, 70 cents, sorry, a bit later. Uh, Westphalia happens, I've used this before, forgive me for this. Westphalian happens between uh, the first volume of The Three Musketeers and 20 years later. You've seen the movie at least. No, but at some point, Richelieu is wearing a full armor, is you know, fighting some other Christians that he didn't quite like. That was Europe for us. Uh, 20 years later, Westphalian uh, peace, and everybody's happy. How is everybody happy? My country, my rules. Your country, your rules. And that's, no, it took years. No, in fact, centuries. It took basically World War Zero in Europe, with no, a disaster comparable to the other two world wars, to reach that simple solution. But from that moment onwards, that was the thing. Now, France, French rules, French uh, king, and Spain, Spanish rules, and so on. Now, that means that geography is lending a hand to law. It means that if you have the boundaries of a place and they are clear to you, then you know exactly how far that law goes. Now, in this particular case, however, uh, you can't do that because that's so-called cyberspace. And in cyberspace, there are no borders. So where, how far do you want to go in asking a search engine to remove the links? Well, the solution that has been found, and we can have more on Q&A on this, has been, so far, European level. So this is a Spanish case, but because it was a, a European Court of Justice decision, the delinking happens to all search engine implementations that are available at the European level. So if you look for uh, uh, the name of someone, Spanish uh, gentleman in question, for example, the, the links have been removed from the 
uh, from Google UK, from Google IT, Italy, Germany, and so on, but they have not been removed from Google Japan, Google Brazil, Google US. Now, some people have argued, uh, especially the data protection agencies in Europe, that that should be the case. They would like to see uh, that ruling applied globally to every implementation of search engine. You can imagine how reluctant a company based in California is to see a European Court of Justice decide which links can or cannot be removed in the search engine American version. But the territoriality remains with us as an issue. When you have the request, and you may or may not have sent one, uh, I met some people who have, uh, so far uh, Google has received something like 200,000 requests for roughly uh, uh, be more than 700,000 or so, uh, if I remember well, uh, URLs uh, removal. Uh, this is, by the way, technically speaking for the engineers among us, nothing is a grain of sand on a small beach in the world for Google. Google removes URLs by the millions a week when it comes to other contexts. So the technical problem, not even Google raises it as an issue. It isn't. But there is a technicality in the technical problem. These are, are requests from you and me. And each of us has a different reasons for having that removal uh, sent to Google. And therefore, there is no software solution. It isn't just, oh, send a request and some kind of algorithm will decide if A and B and C conditions are satisfied, go. Nope. Every single request has to be analyzed by at least a paralegal, which is good for jobs, but bad for efficiency. There was a constraint about who could ask for the removal of the links, at least within the European context, uh, not public figures. Well, just because we are among thinking to academics, who counts as a public figure? It seemed to be obvious initially, politicians, yes, of course. But even politicians, they come and go in terms of political life. Is something that happened to me 20 years ago before I entered the political arena something that I could ask to have removed from Google search engine or not. Well, I'm a public figure now, but I wasn't at the time. And what if I wasn't, am, but will not be? What happens to me, you know, say, in 20 years when I'm no longer a politician? And of course, they are not just politicians. So at the moment, remember, uh, politics thought had found a solution, but it has actually put uh, Google in charge or, in fact, business. At the moment, we have a funny solution in Europe. It is Google who decides, or which decides, who is a public figure or not. And it's quite straightforward. If you search for your name and surname, and you can do that right now on your uh, smartphone, look at the, at the bottom of the page. If he reports that some links might have been removed according to the European legislation, etc., it means that Google thinks that you are not a public figure. If you're a public figure, uh, that line would not appear. I check my father, he is not. I check myself, apparently I am. And that's the difference between who is and who is not a public figure. Google decides. Of course, this is meant in order to protect the privacy of those who actually have requested the links to be removed. Because if you say, oh, by the way, look, this search, this guy has actually requested that some links should have been removed, what well, would defy the problem initially. The other reason for removing these links is public interest. But what is public interest? Again, uh, they didn't ask philosophers, so otherwise we'll still be talking about it. And uh, uh, I say it's not quite clear. I mean, do I have a public interest in knowing that that gentleman in Spain actually had two properties to repossess? Well, to be honest, if I'm someone from the United States and I want to do business with that gentleman, well, maybe I would like to know that he didn't pay his debts and those stuff was uh, repossessed. Well, interesting. But certainly there may be no public interest in other things, like what I had breakfast for breakfast yesterday. On forgetting, forgiving, and recalling, I want to say something a little bit uh, more at length, so bear with me. On the relevance, remember, some of the problems that we have is that, oh, some information might be just no longer relevant. Unfortunately, even in the report that we uh, produced for Google, their line has passed, which is time-related understanding of relevance, which personally, uh, I was happy to compromise. I said, everybody dis dissatisfied. But if I had been the only one to write the report, I would not have put it that way. The logicians among us will know perfectly well that relevance is a total nightmare, even in a completely 
control environment like symbols and very simple Boolean logic. You can't decide about relevance, not even there. In human life, it's a matter of asking every time and again and again. Was that piece of information 10, 20 years ago relevant? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the question, the purpose, the context. It depends on so many things that you can't decide, oh, it's old, therefore irrelevant. I find that uh, quite frankly, epistemologically uh, dubious. But that was the court, and that's the, what the report says. If it is too old, well, there is an inclination to think that it's also become irrelevant. There's something more about data processing that was questionable because Google and the search engine has been uh, described now as, some, as a, a particular entity that processes the data by providing links to that information. Again, I think we're dealing with a legislation that is about 15 years old or so. But if you look at what data processing means in the European legislation on uh, uh, data protection, is basically anything you do with data is data processing which is of course not satisfactory because you lose all possible discriminations between making, you know, observing some data, making a photocopy of those data, backing up the data, or transforming the data in a profile of an individual. That's all you know, the same anyway. Uh, questionable, but that's the line that has passed so far. And we're back to uh, the original point. Now this is what lies in between the general framework of what memories and green memories and uh, the how and the of and the that and played on a Shakespeare. And the very specific single individual in Spain who didn't like that Google had those two lines at the top of the web page. There's an immense amount of debate because basically, as I said at the beginning, a lot of our Western philosophy is a philosophy somehow connected to a philosophy of memory. So it's not surprising that once you start undermining the foundations of that particular sort of framework, you start questioning a lot of fundamental points. Some of which, and that comes to the conclusion of my talk, have got to do with identity, with forgiveness and closure. A quick word on identity. Um, there are roughly, and I'm, I know I'm on, on record, so uh, anyone who's going to see this, please forgive me. There are roughly two ways of looking at uh, personal data. One is in terms of a philosophy of economics. Your data are your, as in my house, my data, my car, I own it, you can't use it, and unless you ask permission, etc. cetera. That, 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 all that line of thinking. And if you trespass, you're trespassing the boundaries of my property. Hmm? It's not accidental that, no, it was developed here, it's 19th century, and it has that kind of a Newtonian economic John Locke kind of background in, 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 in its interpretation. Then there's another way of looking at personal information. And it's got to do not with the philosophy of economics, broadly understood, but with the philosophy of mind, or philosophy of personal identity. My data, or my memories, are more like my hand, my liver, my lungs, my heart. It's not that they are mine as I own them, are mine because they constitute me. This hand is not mine as in my car, but it's part of me. And if you take it away, you take part of me away. Remember, it's known uh, by making a, a copy of my data, I'm not taking away uh, those data. But there's something about cloning here and uh, being intrusive that's got nothing to do with trespassing, but more like kidnapping. Now, why the distinction here? Well, because if you have memories, and if you acquire personal data in a public space, for example, how can you defend that in terms of, oh, that's trespassing? Well, no, you are on a square, gentlemen, so I'm not trespassing any space, or not metaphorically speaking, not even. And I can put all the CCT cameras I want all over the place, UK being the country with most of them installed all over the place. Forget about China. We are the real business here. Uh, we're controlling our citizens carefully. Trespassing and ownership doesn't really cut deeply enough. But kidnapping, well, kidnapping is, is illegal even in public spaces. Uh, and if you take away information from me, it's like you know, cloning myself. That's something that I find disturbing, disappointing. It might actually start constraining who I am, what I can do, who I can become. So that's why 
the right to be forgotten, and generally speaking, a philosophy of memory is so important, is about my data as in my body, and that makes a difference. Of course, it makes a difference in terms of forgiveness, because a lot of forgiveness is based on a management of memory. It's not based on, on forgetting, uh, necessarily, although that's much easier, uh, but it's you know, a careful management of what it means to have things left in the closet. And that's what I want to conclude with, uh, closure. When, uh, when it comes to uh, memories from the past, one way of understanding closure is remembering without recalling. If you had had a fight with a friend, if your spouse and you didn't quite get along last weekend, you don't want to forget, but you don't want to recall that event again and again because that wouldn't be closure. Likewise, if you lost someone, that's not about forgetting that you lost that someone. On the contrary, you want to have that memory very green in your mind, but you don't want to have it made it green again and again. Like a scar is there, and it's there forever, but you don't want to scratch it every time. The blood doesn't have to come out. So in this particular case, uh, when it comes to the right to be forgotten, as a particular misnamed, and we all agreed on all sides that this was a bad uh, label, it stuck, so that's too late. But it's one of those things. It should have never been named in that particular way. Well, it is important because uh, when it comes to wider and bigger issues, when our governments that are asking for the linking, and they have been requests, well, one thing is an issue is, for example, peaceful cohabitation between different uh, ethnicities. One reason, and uh, not ethnicities, but different religion uh, orientations, one reason why we, it took so long to get some peaceful agreement in Northern Ireland was because generations were educated to never let go, constantly rehearsing, regurgitating all the harm, all the violence, all the nasty things that we had been doing to each other that's the Palestinian problem, is always the problem that is the major obstacle before any peaceful talk. Sooner or later, after maybe millennia of you know, human terror and, and fight and pain, we will sit at that table. How fast you get to that table? Well, that's a matter of closure. And a matter of closure is a matter of philosophy or memory. So it is also a matter of rightly managing your past memories. It's not about forgetting, but it is about not recalling. And this is why we could conclude with a bit of biblical wisdom. It's hard not to find something wise in the, uh, the Bible these days. So this is Isaiah, and uh, he's talking about the Exodus. And he says, talking to his friends, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, now, why is this so crucial? And I can give you the Vulgata, which is actually a little bit better than the English. It says, ne memeniretis, which is not forget, but it's do not recall all the time. Now, the exodus for Israel is not something that is supposed to be forgotten. Never. But it's something that you don't want to be stuck with when the new life, after so much pain, is in front of you. So this is a perfect example of precisely not the right to be forgotten, but the right to see memories sediment in a way that provide the ground for the future. So they do not become an impediment towards development, but they actually provide the roots for the flowers to come. And I hope this can open a Q&A for somebody. Thank you so much.